So our first speaker today is Professor Bern Lussum, who joined a couple of months ago, I would now coarsely say, and he's the successor of um, Professor Valka Lang, which uh, most of you, especially also the students, know very well. Um, so we're very happy to have him today here. I think he will be in a better position to talk about himself and to say where he's from and where he, how he came here. Um, I'm very happy to have you here, Bjorn. So the floor is yours. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I actually started in September, so I'm, I'm feeling quite, quite fresh to finding my way around everything. Let me see if I can share. It did work. There we are. Yeah, thanks a lot. I, I'm really looking forward to, to this presentation. I, I think most of you I already met during uh, Ruchi's presentation mm -hmm. uh, last time. Um, so now I can show a little bit more about my research. I hope there's some, some interest, maybe some comment. Maybe we, had, we find a joint inter interface somewhere where we can meet. That would be great. Um, so I'm working, my research traditionally is kind of more organic electronics. Uh, organic electronics doesn't mean anything living. It means it's kind of organic materials, carbon-based materials. And these materials are really flexible. So they are not as fast, as powerful as silicon, but they have some other properties that I think make it, make it really interesting. And I want to show you a little bit. And, to, to have some catchy title, I call it imperceptible systems. Um, you will see what I mean with that in a second. So um, there is actually quite a few uh, groups that look into these imperceptible. They are not necessarily call it imperceptible, but there are a few groups that work in this field. Um, preparing this presentation, I had a little bit more reading, which was which was quite fun. And I found this company, G-Wave. Um, they are working on uh, glucose monitoring. I mean, it's, it's already on the market that you always have this kind of box. So you have a little, uh, little sensor, which is in the box and continuously monitoring your glucose uh, level. And um, we had some discussion in, actually in Kent uh, before I came here with the exercise signs. And they were really interested in a glucose monitor. It doesn't have to be perfectly accurate, well, kind of accurate, but the precision doesn't have to be high. But uh, they said, well, you have to measure uh, the glucose level before you exercise, during the exercise or after exercise, just to make sure you don't, um, uh, well, you, uh, uh, you don't have, the, your sugar level doesn't drop too low. And not going into hypoglycemia or your sugar level is rising. It depends on the exercise. Um, and, and this seems to be a hurdle to uh, people with, uh, um, with, uh, uh, with diabetes to exercise. Although we know that exercise is one of the best ways to control diabetes, uh, at least type 2 diabetes. So they were interested in some kind of sensor that tracks uh, glucose level, it doesn't have to give you a very precise reading, but it has to give a warning if it drops too low or goes too high. Um, the thing is, well, there are these monitors which are around on the market, these boxes that turns out people don't necessarily like them. A, if you exercise well, they, they are bulky. They, they kind of, the, the, the comfort level is very low. And then some people don't really use them because it reminds them of being diabetic. It shows other people that you're kind of ill. So people try to avoid that. So something which is imperceptible, which no one sees, uh, would give an additional boost uh, and would better take on by, by, uh, by people of these diabetes monitors. Um, second one, you see this little sticker on an apple. Uh, well, you can go a little bit further uh, with uh, imperceptible, and there's, there's actually a field that looks into edible electronics. It's not very far yet, but it turns out most of our organic semiconductors you kind of find on this list of um, additives, a lot of additives for food, actually. So some of the semiconductors are there, gold anywhere you can add to food uh, for electrodes. So people are really trying to build some electronics which you can eat, um, which is quite fun. So the idea is 
to have something which you can use as labels for your food and then to be able to track the food for food safety reasons um, or for yeah food safety reasons maybe um, and mainly. Um, many other applications where you would use the imperceptible electron and one thing in, in our discussion uh, with, with Anna uh, was that you were um, talking about these animal uh, studies and we said well if an animal feels there's some sensor on the skin, it gets rid of it. So as, as soon as there's something which with, with where the, the comfort level is not as high, they just rub it off, they get rid of it. So something which is really flexible, really, they don't feel it, they don't see it would be really highly beneficial. Um, this name actually, Imperceptible Electronics, is not my invention, by far not. It's, it goes back to, the, to 2013. Um, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's it's it has been has been first used by Someyer. It's it's a very big and successful group in uh, Japan. Um, and what they understand is that it's very light. It's flexible. Uh, here is one of their sensor error sensor errors. Um, they put on this very flexible foil. Um, this one was not yet stretchable. If you're thinking of a sticker on your skin, it doesn't have to be, it has to be flexible, yes, but it has to be stretchable as well. So that, that's the next step, but people are working on that as well. Um, well, shortly afterwards, there it was this big hype. There's this Rogers group. Um, I, they actually integrated uh, electronics in little stickers um and it's silicon uh, it's amazing that they use silicon so to make silicon this kind of flexible and stretchable they uh built these meander lines um shown here which gives you a little bit of flexibilities and it, it's it's amazing what they do they integrate all kinds of elements um leds inorganic leds actually um uh, individual transistors, uh, RFID uh, tags, all kinds of stuff. He has a strain gauge, um, and they put it on a very flexible substrate. They match the uh, elastic constant to the properties of the skin. And they, you see here, it's it. They just University of Illinois. You can see where they're coming from, or at least there, there's where he started. Um, they integrated that into these kids tattoos, which you just wash onto your skin and then it dissolves after a while. Um, here, that, that is, this is the backside. And then you see here, there's the electronics and definitely it's stretchable. It's on the skin and it's working. Um, so this is kind of really interesting, interesting results they are using. They are using metals, they are using um, uh, silicon uh, actually. Um, then, if you want to go one step further as well, can you even make it so imperceptible that you can eat it? It's not, it's kind of, people are working on it. I don't know if they are 100% serious about that, but there is actually a research uh, development to have this kind of edible and you can do all kinds of funny stuff. It turns out that um, uh, cellulose, so every plant, as piezo, uh, piezo resistive uh, properties, which you can use for microphones, uh, pressure sensors, all kinds of stuff. Here, some, um, some result, um, they use carbon black, for example, here, and then egg white as a capacitor. Uh, it's not the most fastest, uh, fastest circuits, I have to say, for example, here on the, on the toast, they use Vegemite, this kind of spread, it's very, well, often used, I, I guess, in the UK, not so much here. Um, so it's more fun, I guess. Um, but all in all, I think one of the key technologies is organic electronics. Um, yes, you can you can use silicon to integrate electronics, like in the Rogers group did. But then, of course, you have to place the individual. You have to make it very small. So you can play this game. You can make it very small, and it's fine. Uh, so you, what he does, he places individual transistors on the stack. Uh, but of course, then you're kind of losing all this fast um, uh, or fast parallel integration of silicon electronics. That's not 
hundred percent, I guess, the way to go. Um, but we can use different semiconductors, which are itself, even as a continuous film, which are stretchable, uh, flexible, transparent, light white weight, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and this is this, these other uh, semiconductors, for example, organic semiconductors. Um, as I said, it's carbon based. Um, so for example, here, are, this is pentacene, uh, fused five fused rings. Um, then in this presentation, I will um, discuss this kind of polymer quite a lot. If you're a little older, you have used this kind of polymer, it's P.PSS. Um, in former times when uh, photography was analog, so you had these films and this polymer was actually developed for these films to coat these films and to protect these films against electrostatic um, discharge. It's a conductive polymer which you can spin coat onto these films and it turns out it's a very interesting material and we continuously find new, new uh, fancy stuff about this, find out more about this polymer. I will come to that in a second. So these organic semiconductors, uh, they are semiconductors, so they conduct the current. Um, organic electronics, just to show you some, some fancy pictures, I've already showed you this one. So it's really flexible, uh, really light. Um, and so that, that, that's the nice thing. The flexibility, well, it's one thing if you think about some variable electronics. The other thing, if you think about production, um, because you can use a roll-to-roll -roll printing process if it's flexible. Shown here is a, it's, it's hard to see. Maybe you can see a hand here. Uh, this is an organic light emitting diet, which is produced in a continuous roll-to-roll -roll process. And there are some solar cells which are produced in this roll-to-roll -roll process. So you actually, producing meters of meters of solar cells or organic light emitting diodes continuously on a flexible metal foil or something. Um, it depends. Some uh, organic semiconductors are biocompatible. So there is a big push to use uh, semiconductors, organic semiconductors um, in, in neuroelectronics as interface to neurons uh, in different, different ways. Um, Usually the inflammation inflicted by these organic semiconductors is not as bad as if you would put silicon in it. Silicon is very toxic. So you immediately cover that, uh, start an inflammation reaction. So for organic, organic semiconductors, it's way less and you, there are ways to further reduce that. And then finally, as, as I said, it's stretchable. So you can well, stretch it. Good, so organic semiconductors. Um, it's a little different. We all know silicon, silicon you have a band and within the conduction band, valence band, you have electrons or holes and they, they are kind of free and they move as waves. Um, this is different in polymers. In polymers, organic semiconductors, you have the individual polymers. You have the individual molecules and the individual molecules, they have an individual states and this state stays localized. And the hole or the electron is localized in this individual state. Now, how do you get a current to flow? Well, let's say this is one of your, your polymers. This is uh, P3HT, one of the fruit flies of polymers. Um, uh, shown here is the chemical structure. And in the film, you get a crystal of the P3HT. You get a, a precise stacking of these molecules. But still, you have the molecular states. You're not forming a, a continuous band. So here, a positive particle, let's say a hole, is really localized on this molecule. It's not a wave, a complete. But this hole can pick up some thermal energy, and then once it gets this energy, it can hop to the next one, and to the next one, and to the next one. So you, you can transport a charge, but of course, you already see that it's a thermal activated transport, plus the coupling is way less compared to silicon, compared to gallium arsenide, which means the mobility is lower. This is kind of a trade-off you always have to pay in the end. This is one trade-off, but there are another interesting things in organic semiconductors. And one really exciting thing is that you can not only transport electrons or holes, but you can transport ions at the same time. And if you think about kind of bio applications, well, in our body, how we transport 
information, how we transport or uh, control or the processes, it's always ions. It's not holes or electrons. It's, it's ions that, uh, that control our body. But these organic semiconductors, you can transport holes, which we are used to in microelectronics, but you can conduct ions as well. So which kind of interfaces builds the bridge to biology. This is one publication. You have the same polymer, P3HT, but then some chemists found, found a way to add a different, uh, uh, different section to this polymer, which is this PSS, uh, polystyrene. Um, and this polystyrene is hydrophilic. So it sucks in water and within the water, you have a, you have a transport channel for the ions. So you can transport charge holes along the P dot part, uh, along the P3HT part of the molecule and ions along this PSS part. That means there is a very tight coupling between the ion and hole transport in these molecules. Um, coming back, to this very interesting molecule. This is P.PSS. I said that is, it's been invented, I think like 50 years ago, it's around forever and we continuously find new things about this, this polymer. Um, this is the P.dot molecule. The PSS is shown here. Um, the microstructure is kind of shown here. You have um, P.dot rich phases, which is this blue one and you have PSS rich phases. And again, the PSS phase can transport ions and the P dot phase can transport holes. Um, so we get again, this combined transport of ions and holes. And there I will show you in a little bit how you can really use this property and this combined transport to build some really interesting transistors and sensors. So the hole is transported across this blue P dot phase and the ion is in the PSS phase. Good. So this kind of, so this organic semiconductors, I think they are really some parts which you only get with organic semiconductors. You can't do with, uh, with silicon. Um, and a perfect example is this organic electrochemical transistors. Transistor. Um, this is actually a, a technology which is not really new. So it has been the first publication. If you go back in the literature, it has been first published in '84. Um, but it's one of these examples of where people publish somewhere, something somewhere. I mean, it was in a good journal, but it was not very well written the paper. So people forgot about that. It just disappeared until kind of the 2000s. Uh, then people started to look into that and they figured out, well, that's really interesting. Um, it's may, mainly, it was a group in France uh, or at first in Cornell, then he moved to France. Now he's at the, um, I think in, in, in Oxford. Um, uh, and he built these organic electrochemical transistors. Uh, he showed, well, they, you can uh, use it as glucose sensor, for example. Uh, then people shared, well, they have a very high transconductance, these, tran these transistors. And if you remember, transconductance means amplification in these transistors. Um, they are biocompatible. P.PSS is not as toxic as silicon. So people used it to record brain activity. Now even people use it to kind of mimic the processing of information in our brain. Uh, it's not kind of the standard NAND nor gates. It's a, a kind of neuromorphic computing and with firing neurons and people try to uh, uh, remodel that with organic electrochemical transistors. So these, these transistors, how do they work? Um, it's a transistor. So you have three electrode, electrodes. You have a source electrode, so you have a drain electrode, and you have a gate electrode. Source and drain is connected by P dot PSS. So I called it a P dot layer here, the blue layer. And this is P dot PSS. Why is it P doped? Well, you have this uh, P dot, but then you have the negative PSS molecule, which is a p dopen. So the negative PSS charge is compensated by a positive hole on the p dot. 
So you have a p dot fill. Then on top of the uh, of this organic semiconductor, very simple. You just drop it into water. Uh, in at best, you control the uh, salt concentration, the ion concentration inside this water. Then you have an electrochemical gauge. It sounds fancy, but in the end, it can be just as simple as a platinum wire. And with the platinum wire, you can control the potential inside your electrolyte. Well, platinum wire is probably not the best one, but uh, you can control the chemical potential in your electrolyte. So what you do with this control of the, of the uh, electrolyte potential, you have ions inside the water, so you have cations. If you now apply a positive voltage to the gate, well, you're forcing the cations into the P dot PSS. As I said, the P dot PSS can conduct the ions. So the ion enters, the positive cation enters the P dot PSS layer. Then it, um, it uh, neutralizes the negative charge of the PSS and it dedopes the layer. So it neutralizes the doping. Neutralizing doping means you're reducing the whole concentration. Reducing the whole concentration means the current drops, current flowing from source to drain. Good. So just let's let's have a look again. Again, we, very very quickly, we have source and drain electrode. We put the p dot PSS on top. Inside the p dot p dot PSS, we have the negative PSF charge, which is kind of our p dopant. This is compensated by our free holes. And then we apply a voltage between source and drain and we measure a current. And this current is driven by these free holes. Now, as the next step, we put on the electrolyte with cations. We control the potential inside the, in, inside the cation, inside the electrolyte. And then what happens, we are pushing these cations into the P.PSS layer. And then you see, well, we, are, um, we have an excess positive charge. That means we have to get rid of some of the positive charge. And what happens This these positive holes, they are removed from the films. If you're removing holes, free holes from the film, well, we know the conductivity is proportional to the hole density, you're reducing the current. So in a way, you have a transistor, you're controlling the current from source to drain by the gate potential. Good. As we are electrical engineers, we like uh, to, to uh, do a little bit of math, nothing complicated. Uh, there is a standard model of these OECTs, how to describe that. Again, source drain, we have the P.PSS here. And then we model this ion injection process by this, by a capacitor. We have a resistance in the uh, electrolyte, um, should, be, should be small. But then we have the gate capacitance, and this is defined as the um, density of cations you inject into the, your layer uh, here, Q of X, and the potential difference delta V across the capacitor. Now we do standard stuff, which you did in, in uh, I don't know, second class of master course. So charge equals the capacitance times the potential difference, and we say, Every cation neutralizes one dopant atom, and then you get the, the whole density, you integrate Ohm's law, and then you get a standard um, transfer output characteristic uh, where you have a linear regime where the drain current is proportional, linear proportional to the drain source voltage, and a saturation regime well, where the drain current is only proportional to the gate source voltage. This is actually the first. OECT characteristic we measured in my lab that was still in the US. Um, so here, this is uh, Vikas Kafli. He was uh, one of my first PhD students. I was just, he was just, I didn't know him. So he came to my office, asked if I have a uh, thesis topic for him. And I said, well, look at these transistors. There was this one publication and he looked at the, at the paper and he disappeared. So it didn't show up for the next three months. And I thought I lost him. I didn't think about him again, but then he came back with this perfect, uh, perfect output characteristic um, and it's working. Uh, and even someone completely new can reproduce these results within three months with, with some help actually, but it's really, really nice. It is really working. Good, so all this theory is nice, but I think they, it's wrong. <laughs> And why, why do we think it's not 100% correct? So 
remember, we are injecting these ions in, in the film and the ions uh, de-dope the film. So you push in the ions and the ions uh, replace the, um, the holes in the film. And this is, by the way, precisely the steps you're using for the gradual channel approximation. So everything Shockley did in his famous paper to um, when he proposed the, the theory of 10 film transistors, it's, it, we copied that for this model. But the implicit assumption is if you have a depletion transistor, well, usually what you have, you have a space charge of localized and fixed dopants, which give you a positive space charge. No, we don't have fixed localized dopants, but we have cations, and these cations are mobile, and they still see the electric field between source and drain. Well, there's still an electric field here. That means, well, these cations won't stay where they are, but they move, will move towards the drain electrode, which will significantly um, change the, um, the field distribution in the channel and the uh, electrochemical potential along the transistor channel and basically everything. Um, so I, I really try to push Vikash uh, to explain why, why is this, this one working and we couldn't figure it out, why is this transistor working? So we, we took a step back and we said, well, we, we have to set up a simulation. So uh, the problem is you have this ion transport, you have the whole transport and you have these two systems and they're interacting, which means all well, the standard software packages, they are not very good at simulating these, uh, these, uh, these systems. They tend to become unstable. Unstable. So we implemented a little little code in, in MATLAB and played some tricks and came up with this model. It's a standard Laplace equation to calculate the electric field. And here these are just the continuity equations to, uh, to model uh, charge transport. Um, ah, there we are. Um, at first, we said we are, we are only looking at the uh, steady state, so we are not looking at the time uh, derivatives here. We set them to zero. We said we are only looking at the state when everything has been settled. Uh, we have a source, drain, and gate electrode. Here, this red box on the top, this is the electrolyte. On the bottom, the blue, bluish kind of, this is the P dot PSS. And then we had to define boundary conditions, which we suggest set to, to ohmic conditions. Uh, the boundary here on top, we said, well, ions can flow into P.PSS, but holes can't leave P.PSS. And then the gate we just set, we basically just set the ion concentration at the gate to a fixed value uh, to, to keep it simple. Um, so we, we had to put in the, so that people trust these models. You have to put in a lot of efforts to, to verify that. This, this is just one example. This is a picture of one of these transistors. Here, this is the gate electrode uh, here. And then you have uh, several electrodes on the right. For example, you can say the top one is the source electrode. The bottom one is the drain electrode. As I said, this is the gate electrode. Then here, this bluish part, you uh, structure the P.PSS, the organic semiconductor on top, so that you get a current flow from source to drain. And then on top, you, um, you can use salt water. Uh, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, it works. But you can use a solid electrolyte or electrolyte gel as well, which you can structure. So you structure this gel on top of the P.PSS and gate so that it can control ion flow from the gate into the P.PSS. Now we can calculate the transistor. The, we, can, we can vary the length, the channel length of the transistor by using different electrodes. We can measure the potential inside the channel. We did all that. And here you can see some, some uh, results, the experiment are the dashed lines, simulation are the, um, are the symbols. We get a good agreement, I guess. Um, and we see here, plotted here is the channel potential versus the position inside the channel. And again, experiment are the symbols and uh, the simulation are the lines. And we get it to fit. Um, most importantly, you see here, this is the drain electrode. So you see this big jump in the drain electrode. This is not 
the channel pinch off. This is really the accumulation of ions at the drain, which are dominating the switching behavior of this OECT. Okay, um, so the the problem with the model is, well, no, not the, with the model, with the um, current understanding is people thought if they're using a capacitor, they think you're injecting ions and they stay where they are. But in reality, they're not staying where they are, but they will move laterally from source to drain and they will accumulate at the drain. Is there another way to show that you have these lateral ion currents? And to do that, well, we looked at the transient uh, characters of these transistors. So we included this uh, time dependent uh, term here. And then update, uh, take a little time steps, and at every time step, look at the current and the voltage. Um, here is, uh, is, is, uh, is one of these results. Here is the gate electrode, source electrode is here, and what's put here is the cation concentration. Uh, here is the P dot PSS, and on top, this is the electrolyte. And you're switching the transistor off, so you're injecting ions into your film. And you're starting here on the upper left, this is right after switching. And uh, this are increasing time steps. You see, well, the ions are flowing down here, and then they establish an equilibrium over time. But you can already see here these are lines following a particular ion flowing in the device. And you see, well, there is a certain lateral curve. So the ions are flowing downwards, and then they turn and flow along the transistor channel. And while we have the strain source field, so our idea is if we see this lateral current is there, well, we should be able to uh, influence this lateral ion flow by the drain source voltage. So we should, the transient time to switch the transistor, the time it takes to establish new equilibrium should depend on the drain source voltage, which you wouldn't expect with the standard, standard uh, thin film transistor model. Good, and indeed we did these characterization, uh, did, did these experiments. You see here, this is uh, we apply a square voltage to the gate, so we turn switching it on and off. This is the response in the brain current for different transistors. You see this exponential uh, behavior, which you would like to see, and then we vary the brain potential. And as you can see, as you would expect, if you increase the brain voltage, while well, you're dropping the response time, which is not properly described by previous models, but if you take this two-dimensional drift diffusion into account, it, it comes out naturally. Good. So this transistor is a transistor. It's not in itself so interesting. And uh, well, if you have noticed, I'm now at the Institute for Microsensors. Um, so where's the connection there? Um, the the thing is, we can really use microsensor the OECTs as sensors. Uh, here are some results. Well, people use it as potential sensors. That's a transistor, basically, but as chemical sensors as well. Um, all kinds of biomolecules. And it turns out OECTs are really highly sensitive. Um, why is that? Well. If you look at the transistor, and if you think about the transistor geometry, well, if you have a gate, and this gate is an electrolyte, so it sees all the ions flying around. And if we now just change this interface just slightly by some functionalized layer, or we, if we turn on electrochemical redox reaction at this interface, well, this is amplified in the transistor because we have the transconductance, we have the transistor principle. This is amplified in the drain current. So we inherently amplify any change at this interface. Most straightforward one is pH. So what happens if we put in hydrogen peroxide, if we change the pH of the, of the electrolyte, we have the redox reaction at the, at the gate and we should be sensitive to that. It turns out we are highly sensitive to pH. Here's the concentration in millimolar. So here we are at micromolar. And you see we get a behavior that reminds, of, of, reminds us of the Nernst equation. So an exponential dependency of the drain current or change in drain current 
here with concentration. Hydrogen peroxide in itself or pH, well, it, it's not that exciting, but it turns out if you put in some um, oxidase, so some kind of um, um, enzymes into these, uh, into the electrolyte or assemble them on the gate electrode. For example, the, uh, the classical example is GOX. It's the enzyme that is specific to glucose. Um, these are a particular uh, class of enzymes that are sensitive to glucose. Here you have glucose uh, together with uh, O2. Uh, it forms um, a reduced form of glucose plus hydrogen peroxide. So we can sense this, send the selective reaction of the enzyme according to the hydrogen peroxide concentration localized at the gate electrode. You can do that for acetylcholine, so different neurotransmitters, there are all kinds of different enzymes we can use. And here is the, uh, is the um, response. It's not as high as for hydrogen peroxide, which is to expect it, but still we get a very high response. But we would like, if you think about using these sensors for new applications, this is here one micromolar. We want to be in the uh, at least three orders of magnitude level. So there's still a way to go. Okay, so that's always already my end. Next is next last chapter is kind of more the the uh, the outlook. What, what why am I here in Bremen? Uh, what what's probably in in it for the next five years? And I think the whole field is. At, at a status where we can build these beautiful devices, beautiful transistors. We get their really nice publications that show excellent characteristics. But right now, this transition of these individual sensors, individual transistors towards a real device, real, um, a real sensor system, this is what is lacking. And I think this is exactly um, what we can reach here at BRIM um, and in particular at IMSIS. Um, we tried to do that in Kent, but honestly, we, we failed. We submitted that to the, uh, to the NSF and they said, well, how do you want to do that with your small clean room in, in, in Kent? So our idea was, and it's, I think it's a good idea, we work with the uh, biomedical, with the um, uh, medical school of Kent State, which is a neomed uh, with auditory science. And they're interested how we process speech. Uh, they were looking at rats, at mice, and it turns out it's, uh, it, is, it has something to do with uh, kind of in which state our brain is in. And, and, and the state of our brain depends on the neurotransmitter concentration, acetylcholine, for example. Not so much in the transmission of signals inside the brain, but the background concentration. This influences how you feel, how ready you are to learn, and how you process speech on, in general. So they are really interested not to look at firing of individual neurons, but to see the chemical environment as well. What is the concentration in neurotransmitters at the same time with a high um, spatial and um, temporal resolution? Um, there are some ways to do that. There are some first studies to integrate chemical sensors with electrical sensors on these little needles, which they use to measure inside of a brain of a rat or of mice. If you see these, these kind of curves, it's not 100% convincing the measurements, but at least there is some hope. So they, uh, they, they were measuring glutamate, but they are measuring only the direct redox behavior of glutamate. With our transistor, we would be able to amplify the signal and hopefully to get a bit better signal. Um, the hope is, to really be able to integrate that here at IMSIS in our clean room. Um, I saw Andreas uh, here and he has this beautiful systems. Uh, the, he made these beautiful mats, these beautiful needles. So it's kind of the ideal situation we can, we have or, or I have these transistor technology, the, the integration technology actually IMSIS is really, really far, really can do a lot there. So how can we combine them? To build a larger, larger system. 
it doesn't have to be only these it's just one example of neurotransmitters you can think about lots of very different devices uh variable devices on flexible substrates um how can we integrate them how can we interface that with conventional electronics how can we add some wireless transmission to these kind of sensors so just to just to kind of wrap this up this is where i've been so far doing materials development device research and the hope is just to extend that towards an integration uh, and there's actually well we have lots of that at INSYS but of course there I think there is quite quite some some connection to other groups and you no know, I spent my first month meeting people here at BRIM and it, it's really really exciting to see what's going on and I think what we would need and where I see kind of lots of potential for interaction is uh, well how can we once we do the, once we have the system, once we have these measurements, how can we transmit them? How can we read this, this data out? How, and plus, we can't do everything with our organic electronics. That, that's just in, not realistic. How can we combine that with silicon? That's our, something I don't know. Uh, I'm not an expert in. If you want to do that a little bit further, well, we not only need uh, uh, physics and electrical engineering, but we would need chemistry as well. We depend on good materials. We depend on new semiconductors with a uh, targeted with a targeted synthesis to get a certain uh, 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 certain properties. And we need definitely need the input input from biology to see what's interesting, what's needed, what can we do. But I think the nice thing is in, in BRIM, actually, it's all there. Um, so that is making it really, really interesting here. OK, that's the end. Um, so I hope that I can convince you that organic electronics and these mixed organic conductors are really interesting. You can do a lot. There's a lot of basic physics to understand. There's a lot of applications we can do. Um, but we have to take this next step and translate that these first really nice device level results into really systems. And I guess, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, questions? I guess that was an unusual portion of physics and chemistry for us. <laughs> I haven't seen so much of that uh, since probably my own studies. It's uh, yeah. highly interesting. Like, uh, yeah, the question is really what what can we do now with that? Like, uh, you're also saying it that that the ideas are there and the principle is working. Um, but to integrate it with real applications, you need to have something which has a real interface um to a standard device let's say right right and that's something um you probably know best what would you need uh what are you looking at what what are the properties you would need how would such an interface look like Well, my, my, my kind of, well, the easiest possibility, of course, is just to have an interface which already exists, right? Like um, analog digital interface, <laughs> something yeah. like that. That will be the easiest possibility for us, of course, to, to connect it directly then to a device and to use the sensor data. Yeah. Um, like I see really lots of applications here, especially as you were saying it, especially in the health sensor and also in the um, in, in the agricultural sensor, like especially with, with livestock. Um, amazing also other possibilities. The pH sensor will be of great interest. Can you, can you somehow uh, quantify how expensive this technology will be? <laughs> Sorry, I, I hate that question myself, but um, yeah. just an idea. 
It's it's yeah, it, it's a tough question. I can't give you kind of a don't I mean don't don't quote me on that. <laughs> but the hope is um P.PSS, so this organic semiconductors, you buy it in kilograms. It's it's an old material, the synthesis is there. I think even the patents have expired. So this is cheap. You can process it on cheap substrates. Um, the integration, the lithography is not, you don't need nanometers, it's micrometer. It doesn't have to be really fine integration. You need some kind of lithography, I guess, but it doesn't have to be high-end lithography. Um, there's even, uh, people try to use um, printing process, roll to roll process, which, well, then you go, you, you have this, you just have meters of this this stuff. So if you can do that, you can further push down the cost. Um, but of course, it's always new technology and it turns out to be different than you think. Uh, but the hope is there that it is cheaper. Mm -hmm. At least if you look at the materials cost, if you look at the processing cost. Um, on the other hand, of course, you need this interface. You always need kind of uh, some, some silicon on the chip. Then it becomes complicated. Um, you need to think about how many of these devices do you need. That's actually one thing. If you look at solar cells, organic solar cells, you need tons of them. They can play these tricks with this roll-to-roll -roll coating that really drops, pushes down the, the costs. The sensors, where you probably need hundreds of thousands of sensors, that's not going to help help a lot, their different costs are important. So bottom line, I think it can be cheaper, but I try to avoid that, to, to advertise that because it's not 100% sure and it depends on so many things. It's, it, it's more important that we have new functionalities which we don't wouldn't get with other materials. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just, um, I'm just really just practical wondering, like, of course, when you're not that far to run with hundreds of sensors and so on, but I'm just wondering in practical terms, if, for example, we decide to make a project together to try to put that all together and just to get the data out, we will probably focus on one single sensor and one yeah. single object of interest. The question is how much, uh, like, you will need probably that money for the, your clean room and oh yeah, actually, yeah. So but are you that far actually to say we're brave enough to try it and to build some sort of a analog digital interface whatever we can think about that i mean well, at the moment i'm i'm a one-man group so um no one is here but the first poster will start uh two weeks now so um well we have the glucose sensor it is working um it is working kind of stable uh, i mean with stable i don't mean years but for our purposes would be stable um this interface uh, of a da conversion um that is something where we would need some kind of external electronics at the moment maybe some kind of uh, chip you can buy and we integrate on a flex board or something uh but i think that is something that's that's something we have to do and and which is interesting to do. Hmm. Yeah, that would show definitely the potential of this, right? Yes. Because uh, then we can start really thinking about real applications and, uh, or at least also from our perspective to start to integrate that idea simply into our plans and to into our research, like, you know, like into our assumptions, let's say. Yeah. So something, it doesn't have to be a very fancy setup, but something, um, kind of a setup if, which we can use for different kinds of sensors to just to, as you said, um, to prove, kind of prove the idea that it is in principle working where we can probably switch out the different, uh, uh, different sensors. Mm -hmm. That would be nice. That would be very, very interesting. But uh, maybe the others also have some questions or comments. I have a question. So thank you, Professor Husem, for your nice interesting presentation. Uh, my question would be, so suppose that means these organic electronics, I think this is well, now we have seen this is well suited for medical implants also. 
Yeah? And if you have an implant, then you don't want to replace it uh, every two months. So that means it should be long sustainable. So are there already research insights? How long these materials last? How long such a sensor unit or something uh, would be uh, sustainable, would sustain inside the human body? Um, yeah, I mean, there are two ways to look at that. One way is that if you implant that, uh, there are people that trying are trying to develop devices that dissolve over time. So you only have operation once, and then you don't have to uh, do a second operation just to get the sensor whatever out again. Um, so they are first tries. Uh, I would have to check how far they are. I think it's more kind of an idea. Um, I, I, but definitely there is some research into that. Um, the other thing is, if you really want to implant something, you would like to be stable and be there for a longer time. Um, and then, A, well, if you have pedo PSS, you have less inflammation. If you have a flexible subset, you have less inflammation because you're the tissue, you're damaging, there's less uh, damage to the tissue. There's as well some research to uh, um, uh, synthesize semiconductors, organic semiconductors, which have some anti-inflammation drugs in it or some groups which are known to reduce the inflammation reaction to really counteract that. Otherwise, you just uh, the body is, is really clever. It sees it's a foreign object, and then it just encapsulates that. And then it takes, I don't know how long, and it just uh, loses functionality because it's encapsulated. But there are ways to, to get around that. So I think there are two ways. One is you want to have it really long-term stable. One is you want to dissolve it. It's just for short use, and then it should disappear. And, and, and people are going in both directions. Okay, thank you. But what I have in mind, Anna already mentioned it, is uh, if it's possible um, to use it also for, for underground monitoring for, because there we need this pH value and uh, the soil moisture or the volumetric water content. Uh, but I know that even the, the classical sensors are made or are stated that they are uh, usable for one to two years after that they will be dissolved in the in the soil. Um, so I think if we find a way, the ones we are currently using are quite expensive, especially the uh, pH sensors for soil monitoring are just available by one or two manufacturers, at least with usable results. But if there is something uh, possible there uh, would be really nice, which we can also try out. And in an ideal case, it would work uh, together with our uh, sensor platform. Yeah. So right now the sensors, I guess they they are using kind of a it's a redox, uh, redox based sensor, electrochemical. For the pH, honestly, I heard about it, but I have basically no background in this area. So I know that they're quite expensive. I asked for them for an area and then I explained how to measure it. And we ended up some, something we stopped at 15,000 euros. I said, okay, okay, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, two years sounds really long for us. <laughs> Uh, so most likely our transistors won't survive two years in in uh, in the soil. Uh, but uh, I mean, we can we can give it a try and just bury them <laughs> and see if we uh, how stable we get a signal. Because this would be really nice. This is where we are continuously working, and we have several options to test it uh, here directly. Would, would be something where we have an application and we're desperately looking for, let's say, sensors which are not cost costing that much and uh, showing a uh, usable accuracy. Yeah, I, we have to we have to check. I mean, I, I assume, I mean, these, these sensors that are existing for this application, I would guess they are already highly, I mean, they put a lot of effort into developing that. Um, so it, it's really a very high bar. 
Mm. Uh, but we, we can we can have a look how they are doing that, and if you can use ours, if there's a benefit, if, we, if, we, if there's at least the potential to become better. Yeah, definitely. Other questions? Okay, thank you. I, I, can I ask something? Of course. Yeah, thank you, Professor, for a very nice presentation. I was attracted to the first bit on uh, using, uh, monitoring the sugar level, maybe after the exercise and before exercise. Mm -hmm. Then I came, then the, uh, the visual pangre system came into my mind, the one that people are currently articulating for. So is there, can we, if using the, the organic electronic that you have presented to us, is it also a, a technology that can support that the visual pangre system for diabetic patients, or can, or can it do something close to that? Thank you. Uh, could you, I'm sorry, could you repeat the, the, the questions? It's... Okay, the question is, uh, I was asking you if the technology on organic electronic can be used to develop an artificial pangreas for diabetic patients. Oh, oh yeah. Um, oh, that's a tough. <laughs> um, well, the, the idea is, I mean, the, the idea with all these glucose monitor, continuous glucose monitoring is to have this, this continuous measuring. So you're tracking the glucose level and then you have some artificial intelligence to deliver uh, insulin uh, with a pump. Um, so it's it's still a way to go, I guess. Are there systems that are doing that? I don't think so. Yeah, um, there are. Like there is open yeah. so system known as Open APS, mm -hmm. where users are allowed to build their own system. It is completely open source, and it is even available online. Okay. The well, the the idea here is well, we we can do the sensing part. Um, but there, I guess, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's an, it's an example. And I, I chose this example because it, it's easy to explain, but of course there's all these existing technology already there. Um, so that, that's a hard, that's okay. a big hurdle. Yeah. Uh, then lastly, I think it will be interesting if we are able to measure the, the sugar level of someone before an exercise, after an exercise, we do that and visualize. I think it will show us that there is a promise on implementing the technology, maybe mm -hmm. full scale in the future. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, it's it's definitely interesting. I mean, we, we have the sensor. The sensor gives a good good reading. In principle, the sensors which are on the market right now do the same redox reaction, but we, we inherently amplify this redox reaction. Uh, so we get a higher signal to noise, which probably is helpful for the readout and the DA conversion. Um, plus, it's probably more the electronics part around that, which is the problem right now, where you still have this this kind of flexible, uh, not flexible, this 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 box you have to carry around. That that is, I think, something we have to look at. Okay, thank you. <laughs>